Today on Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy, a lesson on living holy. You and I are called to mimic God. We're to mimic the Almighty. We're to echo His eternal words. We're to reveal His heart of love. We're to model His holy character. We're to reveal His kingdom rule. See, just as children mimic their parents, so we, the dear children of the Heavenly Father, will want to mimic Him. We want to be like Him. We want to reflect His character and His conduct and His commitments. Many people struggle to navigate the choppy waters of sexual temptation in today's world. But today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy tackles this challenging topic head on. In a culture where anything goes, discover how to anchor your life in God's timeless truth. We're getting practical tools to guard our hearts and minds and find hope for a fresh start. It's the second part of a message from the Life Together series titled, Not Even a Hint. It's available online at ktt.org. Here's Pastor Philip now to get us started. In a world of sexual sin, in a world of gender confusion, in a world of marital ambiguity, in a world of idolatrous individual freedom with regards to sexual behavior, our desire and our commitment ought to be as one who wants to remain unspotted from the world. You see, in a world where nothing is fixed and everything is fluid, even our gender, the Christian is anchored to the truth and reality that God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. Sexual holiness. That's what we're told in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 to 8. In fact, we're told there, this is the will of God for you. Avoid sexual immorality. And so to that end, I want to turn to Ephesians 5, verses 1 to 7, because here Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, and he calls them to pursue the protection of their purity. Now remember, these verses, these verses are written to Christians who are living out their Christian life in a very impure culture. Their context is our context. Now there's three things here, if time allows us. He calls them to imitation. He calls them to insulation. And he calls them to illumination. I'll make that clear as we work along. Look at verses 1 and 2, the call to imitation. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also loved us. There's the call to imitation. I want you to mimic God. And that means walking in love, manifesting love, the, the love that Christ showed for us. That's the Spirit that's being addressed here. So the call to imitation, verses 1 to 2, the call to insulation, verses 3 to 4. The opposite of walking in love is walking in lust. Walking in love is the mark of the church. Walking in lust is the mark of the world. And so Paul calls the church to reject sexual lust, which marks the surrounding culture, put that off and put on love modeled after the cross. Let's move through these verses as quickly as possible. There's four things here, as time allows us. Let's call it the sanction. Paul is first giving them a sanction. He's forbidding certain behavior, and he's reminding that that forbidden behavior has punishment attached to it. He sanctions sexual sin. Look at verse 3. But fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, We don't even want a hint of it among the saints at Ephesus. Neither filthiness, foolish talk, coarse joking. That's not fitting. Spend your time giving thanks. So that's the sanction. Got to speed up here. The standard we've touched on, but I'll drill down on it just ever so briefly. What is the standard? The standard that Paul sets before the Ephesians in a sexed Christian society is the church ought not to be scandalized by this once. See, God has not called us to uncleanness, but to holiness. And He not only calls us to that, He gives us the power to do it through the indwelling Holy Spirit. 
And so Paul says, no, here's the standard, not even a hint of this depraved, debauched lifestyle. I mean, go to Paul writing on this in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11 and, and 18 and the surrounding verses. He says, look, the sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Notice past tense. <laughs> but the cross has broken that cycle. And the Spirit of God is developing within you a new lifestyle. You're putting off the old man and you're putting on the new man. Such were some of you, but now you're washed and you're sanctified and you're justified. So keep fleeing immorality. And remember, their body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's quite a standard, isn't it? Not named, not found, not tolerated. This radical standard requires radical holiness. Maybe that's why Jesus told us, right, when it comes to both physical adultery and mental adultery through lust and looking at a woman and undressing her and imagining things that are unholy, Jesus said, we've got to deal with that. And so I'm encouraging you, if your eye offends, pull it out. If your hand offends, cut it off. Now, some took that literally. It was never meant to be taken literally. And some men in the early church castrated themselves in their fight against lust. But Jesus is not teaching self-mutilation because you can sin with one eye and pull it out and you have another eye to sin with and should you pull both eyes out, blind men can lust. It's not the point. It's do what you need to do. Get serious about sexual sin and sexual temptation it's the mark of the unregenerate. Yes, believers can commit it. Believers can lapse into it. But it must never be a pattern, a lifestyle. So get serious about it. Show that you're saved. Prove that Christ is at work in you in breaking the dominion of sin in your life. And so, hey, if it means pulling the plug on your electronics and your technology, do it. If it means stopping a subscription, do it. If it means not hanging out with a certain person, do it. Whatever it takes, do it. Making yourself accountable and vulnerable to others concerning this, do it. Get serious about it. That's the standard. In fact, I quoted Erwin Lutzer earlier. Let me quote him again. He says this, somewhere I read, when you're going to jump across a chasm, it's much better to do it in one long jump than two short ones. <laughs> so just when we deal with sin in our lives, it's better that we deal with it thoroughly, completely, without making it easy to retrace your steps. See, that's what it means. Run from immorality. Flee it. No looking back like Lot's wife. You and sin should never part as friends looking for each other in the future. That's the standard. That's the sanction. What about the status? I'd love to develop this, but we'll come back to this in verses 8 through 14. They're saints. They're saints. That's a word that kind of scares us. The Roman Catholic tradition has taken that word and turned it into a special category of Christian, some elite corpse of Christian. But it's not. The same was an everyday Christian who understood that since Jesus got a hold of them, they were now set apart for God's glory and God's special use. Do you understand that? Do you desire a saintly life? You know, we use that word a lot more. I don't hear Christians talking about that as much. I'm going to meet with the saints of God the set-apart ones, the holy ones, those who are marching to a different drumbeat, those who are out of step with the world. Not odd for God. You'll find them where you'll find everybody else unless it's flagrant sin. They raise their kids among us. They work in our factories among us, but they're different. Their speech is different. Their dress is different. Their conduct is different. Their marriages are different. Their kids are different. That's where we're at with the word saint. It's a distinct people within the city limits of any city. It's what Peter calls the holy nation, right? In 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10. And I hope that you bear that in mind. If you go back into the Old Testament before we leave this thought, 
What do we have? The Holy Sabbath, which means what? A day set apart for special use, unlike the other six days. We've got holy vestments that the priests would wear, which were, you know, clothes set apart, designated for religious activity and special use. The temple was a holy temple, a, a location, a space, a, a place dedicated for the worship of God for special use. And you and I need to realize that wherever we put our feet is holy ground because we're bringing a distinct lifestyle to that moment and distinct values and commitments to that event. And so we need to set ourselves apart. And especially when it comes to sexual purity, we're to live in a way that's fitting for saints. If you go to 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul says, you know, God has not called us to uncleanness, but the holiness. Paul says, this is the will of God for you. Abstain from sexual immorality. And part of that is what? Possessing your own body and honor. And as I thought about that, I wrote a few things down to myself and I hope to your benefit. As we think about our bodies with regards to our eyes, why don't we set them apart and watch what we watch? Job did that. Job 31 verse 1 where he made a covenant with his eyes not to look upon the virgins of Israel, the young, attractive women. With regard to our feet, why don't we set our feet apart? Why don't we watch where we go and whose example we follow? Proverbs 7 verse 8 tells us about a naive young man in Israel who walked towards the harlot's house. He's gone in the wrong direction. You know, you know, you're making yourself a sitting duck. Don't go there. Bad things happen there. Right? I mean, let's be honest. There are certain places, there are certain sides of town. You don't go as a Christian. Just don't go there. You don't take your feet there. It's madness to do that. With regard to our bodies, we should watch what we wear. In fact, the young woman, or the woman that propositions the young man in Proverbs 7, verse 10, it says of her, she was dressed like a harlot. There's an interesting thought. You can dress like a harlot. You add that more positively to 1 Timothy 4, verse 9, where the Christian woman is encouraged to wear modest clothing. Certainly, those passages talk about beauty and physical attraction. There's nothing unholy about that. But you know what? You need to be careful about what parts of your body you put on public display because that can be troublesome. You you need to be holy in your dress. That's a tough one in California and I think it needs to be thought out a little bit more. With regards to our tongues, we're to be careful what we say. If you go to Proverbs 5, 3, it talks about the harlot and how her lips are like honey. He engages her in conversation in chapter 6, 24 and chapter 7, 21. You need to be careful with your words. Don't get involved in intimate conversations with the opposite sex. It's dangerous. Leads to sin. With regards to our ears, we've got to be careful what we hear. There's all kinds of lies out there. If it feels good, it must be good. If it doesn't harm anybody, surely it's right. And the world will propagandize us, if that's a word, all the time. And we've got to be careful what we're listening to. Proverbs 5, verse 1, the father says to him, give me your ear. I've got to talk to you about sexual things. I'm going to bring the wisdom of God's word and what I've seen, what I've learned. Finally, with regard to our hand, why don't we set it apart and be careful what we touch and when we touch it? Because 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1, Paul says, I want you to stay single. I prefer that you don't touch a woman. That's a euphemism for sexual contact within marriage. Touch. It's a beautiful thing in its time and in its place. It's a bad thing out of place. And there is such a thing as a sexual touch which arises. And Paul's saying, hey, be careful with your eyes, your feet, your bodies, your tongues, your ears, your hand. Don't do anything that's not fitting for the saints of God called the purity. Let's move on. The solution. Amazingly, one of the weapons in the fight for purity is thanksgiving. Look at verse 4. Neither filthiness nor foolishness, coarse jesting, 
It's not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. This seems out of place, doesn't it? Here we are talking about sexual sin and and temptation and the battle to stay pure. And Paul's saying, hey, you want to fight that? Do it with thanksgiving. Doesn't seem right. Seems kind of disjointed, but the more you think about it, it is right. Because at the heart of every sin, including sexual sin, is ingratitude to God. Go back to Romans 1, 21 to 25. It says that, you know, they stopped worshiping Him as God. They were unthankful. And considering themselves wise, they became fools. At the heart of sin is an ingratitude. It's a lifestyle of no thanks to God, and it's a belief that there's a greater pleasure outside of God. Listen to this. Thanksgiving is an antidote for sin, for it is difficult to give thanks to God for His goodness and and proceed to act badly. Love for God expels love for sin. Thankfulness, thanksgiving is an antidote for sin, for it has us focused on the generosity of God and the fact that He has joyfully given us all things that we need, and that will protect us from pursuing substitute gods that promise pleasure and joy. Thanksgiving focuses us on the real gifts, not the phony and empty promises of sin. Actually, if you think about it, if you and I spend more time being grateful and thankful for what God is and what God has done in our lives and what God has given us, it'd be so much harder to sin. Every time we sin and betray God, it's an act of ingratitude. Lord, what you've given is not enough. I need something more. Terrible. In fact, as I thought about that, I thought about the story of Polycarp, second century bishop in Smyrna, when he was being led to his death as a martyr for Jesus Christ, they asked him to swear against Christ and be set free, and he refused. And here's what he said, Eighty-six years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king? See, he lived in an attitude of gratitude. He's done me no wrong. He's only done me good. How can I betray him? Thanksgiving helps us fight lust. Okay, time's gone. So the last thought would have been calls them to illumination. And I'll touch on the most important part of this. It would be verses 5, 6, and 7. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. God does not tolerate sin and a perverted counterfeit love called lust. He will punish it, and it will end in his judgment and damnation. That kind of a lifestyle, someone given to that. See, Christians can lapse into sin, but they won't wallow in it. They won't be like a pig in mud. Remember how Peter warned us, you want to see a false professor and a false teacher? They'll kind of clean their lives up, and then you'll see them go back like a pig goes back to them. Mire, so they'll go back to their old dirty life again and again and again without that being broken. And that's the mark of the unregenerate. And that's where we're at here. We're not talking about Christians who lapse into sin, but Christians don't go on practicing sin. They break its dominion in their life. But those who don't, those who pursue this, the sexually liberated will not escape God's coming judgment. God's judgment is like dark clouds in the horizon coming. And Paul says, hey, you need to be aware of that. You know that. No fornicator will inherit the kingdom of God. And remember that and stick by that because the culture will try and deceive you with empty words. will try and talk you out of this idea of judgment and damnation and hell. Paul warns about deceptive and empty words that will seek to pour cold water on the idea of God's white hot wrath. Paul says, you know what? There'll be libertines and antinomians in the church who will say, We're under grace, not under law, so you can do whatever you want. It's forgiven. There'll be false prophets who'll say, peace, peace, safety, no judgment, no hell, no damnation. There'll be Gnostics who will say, you know what, the body's evil, so you can do anything you want with the body and won't touch your soul. Paul says there's all kinds of empty words and deceptive words. You're going to hear it all, but you know the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. Don't let them sweep the ashes of Sodom and Gomorrah under the proverbial carpet. That God still lives. 
and their attempt to deny the existence of hell and the holy and settled wrath of God against sin, it flies in the face of Scripture. It contradicts the teaching of Jesus because he talked more about hell than he did about heaven. It's an attack upon the holiness of God. It's a belittling of the gospel because you see, God's wrath was visited on Jesus because God's wrath against sin is real and you've got to put your faith in Jesus where God indeed judged your sin. He's either going to judge it in you or he's going to forgive you because he judged it in Christ and you believe that to be true. Just this past couple of days, I discovered an amazing story that in 1997, Chinese firefighters succeeded in putting out a fire that had been raging for 400 years. You can look that up. It's a true story. In a place in China, Bai Yang He, there was a coal field that started to go on fire in 1560. It consumed 127 million tons of coal before it was extinguished. 400 years is a long time, but it's nothing in the light of eternity. And on the authority of God's Word, hell is a fire that will never go out. And men may pour water on it with their empty words, their lying deceits. But that fire will never go out. And the man or woman who's given to a pattern of sensualism and sex outside of God's boundaries is destined for that place. And if that's you, I want you to know that there is hope. There was a woman caught in adultery in John 8 and met Jesus and, and she confessed her sin and repented of it. And Jesus said, okay, I forgive you. And I go and sin no more. My friend, God can make you clean this morning. God can give you a new start this morning. God, by His grace, can help you live a holy life for His glory this morning. And I trust that you'll pursue that. You're listening to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy and the conclusion of a message titled, Not Even a Hint. You can replay this message online at ktt.org or on the KTT app and podcast. Philip? If after hearing today's message, you're at a crossroads about following Christ, I want you to know that Know the Truth is here for you. Whether you're burdened about your sin and your debt before a holy God, whether you're burdened by the challenges of life, longing for fulfillment, or in search of genuine love and peace. We want you to know that Jesus extends an invitation unlike any other. He invites you, He beckons you to find rest and peace in Him. In Matthew 11, Jesus tells those who are burdened and weary to come to Him and find rest. In John 10, He tells us He has come to us that we might have life and that more abundantly. If you're ready to take the step to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're here to pray with you, provide guidance, and get you set up with some great resources. If you're not ready, we'd still love to talk with you and answer any questions you might have about the Christian faith. Wayne, will you tell our listeners how to get in touch? I sure can. You can call us at 888-644-8811 or send us an email at info at ktt.org. And to stay connected with Know the Truth, simply head over to our website at ktt.org. There you'll discover a treasure trove of inspiring resources, like Philip's So True Devotional, which offers bite-sized theology that speaks directly to your heart and mind. Plus, you'll find links to our social media pages, making it easy for you to stay updated on all things Know the Truth and share the gospel message with others. I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd. Join us tomorrow for another message from the Life Together series titled, Keep the Light On. That's Wednesday on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Mm -hmm.